Justin Nall here. I am extremely excited about my guest today because we're going to venture away from the land of fitness and nutrition for a little while and we're going to talk about all things personal finance. My guest today is Garrett Gunderson. He is the founder of Wealth Factory and a best-selling author and all-around financial genius. I've introduced a lot of people to your work now and I kind of give this warning, the same warning I give with myself. Where I'm like, hey, you start consuming my content, like fair warning, it's, it's a lot of this stuff is going to go directly against what the mainstream is telling you to do. I think you'll know the statistics better than I do, but it's something like 80% of people can't afford a $400 emergency, but they have these really strong beliefs about like their 401k or their investing and, and all this. And I know that you start with philosophy and that's why I brought up, uh, you have some funny stories I heard you tell about with, with your wife. Your philosophy wasn't always this abundance mindset. How do you get that abundance mindset and abundance versus scarcity in the world of finance? I think you call it like the greatest destroyer of wealth, right? Yeah, scarcity destroys wealth faster and more, there's more like just reach of scarcity than any other thing. And like, do you know, I was first married. It's amazing I'm still married because I was a straight up miser. Straight yeah. up miser, like my wife, so I gave this TEDx talk in January and I told a couple of miser stories. And so I call my wife, I'm with one of my clients and one of my guys that runs my company, it's a friend. And then my client brought someone with them and we're just riding in the car. And I'm like, hey, it went well, I got a standing ovation. I was like super pumped up. I'm like, I told stories about being a miser. And then all of a sudden my wife chimes in with all these additional stories and everybody in the car is cracking up. I'm like, whoa, oh, I can't hear you. We're breaking up. Shit. Yeah. Like, because, dude, I was such a miser that for Christmas one year, I bought her a phone that what uh, a case for her phone that didn't fit the phone because it was cheap. Okay. <laughs> like it didn't even fit the phone. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, like, no, yeah. it was it was a dollar. Like so we <laughs> saved a bunch of money. She's like, but it doesn't fit the phone. Exactly. And, like her dad was like, Hey, you you want to move into the basement? Cause like you guys could just live there rent free. So I go to my wife, I'm like, dude, we gotta live in your parents' basement rent free. She goes, Sex free with that strategy too. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, damn. So I was like, Yeah, dude, I was a miser. I read the millionaire next door. And yeah. so my life was about what I could cut out and eliminate. And I had this epiphany that that's a very finite game. That's very limited because it's really selfish. Like you don't think of it as selfish when you're in it. You think yeah. of it as like smart or, you know, doing things other people aren't willing to do and sacrificing. And my mantra was, I'll live like no one else lives now. So in the future, I can live like no one else can. Mm -hmm. My dad was like, hey, I respect that, but I don't think that's the right philosophy. He says, because you can never buy back the memories you never have. Mm. Ah, so Jeez. what happened was I, was, I was at this thing in Vegas where I was getting an award and there was like a thousand people there. And after I got the award, I was out in the hallway and I see this woman, Nancy. And actually the event where, um, where uh, Rob, uh, you know, heard me mm -hmm. the first time, the, Nancy happened to be in the crowd. Now this is like 17 years later, but when I got this award, Nancy and I were talking because she, I highly respected her. She was well known in the financial industry. And uh, I started telling her, you know, hey, I'm excited about this. I'm excited to meet you. I'd love to learn from you. She goes, really? Would you like? So, so she starts asking me questions. Mm. And she sees immediately, dude, I am in scarcity. Like, I'm a miser. And she yeah. says these words. She goes, I wonder what it's like living in the financial prison that you built for your wife. Ugh. Because my wife's a teacher and I won't buy her clothes. Her mom's buying your clothes. I'm making six figures at this time. We're living wow. in a crappy apartment where we could afford something much, much nicer. But I was like, no, 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 we're gonna save, we're gonna scrimp, we're gonna budget. I was, I was that miser and when she said those words, dude, it hit me mm -hmm. and I called my wife and I was like, hey, I'm sorry, I'm an asshole. Like I, I didn't see it, but now I see it. And my wife was really cool and forgiving, but I actually started crying and then people get let out of the session. I'm just <laughs> sitting there turning up like, oh, look at that kid, he's so proud of his award, you know, or whatever right, it was, right. but, but it was actually just recognizing how much scarcity had grabbed me, but dude, I learned it. I learned yeah. it from my family. You know, imagine my great grandfather leaves Italy, leaves his wife who's pregnant behind because he can't afford to bring her over at the time to get a job in a coal mine to send money back and doesn't see them for seven years. That mm. creates a lot of scarcity, like almost at a cellular level. It creates a paradigm where it's like scrimp and save and sacrifice. It's almost like this, this immigrant mentality and it really had a stranglehold on me until that moment. Now, yeah. it wasn't like I had an epiphany and, and never had scarcity again, but it was a paradigm shift that was crazy because that next year, I made double what I made the year before and we bought our dream home. 
And like that home was, we loved it. Like I used to bring people over. We hosted monthly parties. We had theme parties. We, you know, we just had so much fun and so many good memories where in our apartment, we could never do that. It yeah. was constrained. And I remember the utility was in a, it was so cheap and dilapidated. So, so that's part of like the transition for me of leaving behind scarcity and embracing abundance. And then I can at least now detect when it's coming up. I can sense when it's there so I can make different choices because I have very specific formulas. Yeah. The crazy thing too, is I feel like I was so drawn to this abundance principle. I mean, it's particularly anything mindset, growth mindset versus fixed mindset and all that abundance versus scarcity, but man, you're going against the grain. Cause it's not just like, there is a very real thing called transgenerational epigenetics of like our, I believe epigenetics is what I'm here to heal, man. Yeah. I'm doing the epigenetic work right now. Right? Like I'm, I'm going into like, where did this come from? You know, it's imprinted cellularly. Why do I believe this? Yeah. Are we holding on to this anger? Like generational healing is a big part of my mission now. Epigenetics, you nailed it, dude. I yeah. call it genetic wealth, and I didn't come up with that term. I learned it from the book Deep Nutrition. By okay, Kim. yeah, that was yeah. a great book, man. Yeah. Yeah. Genetic it's, wealth. It sounds crazy to people, but it really, like, I look back, like, my dad's a self-made guy, right? He has no college degree, grew up on welfare, and made millions of dollars. But, hit, you know, that scarcity mindset, being one of seven kids, you know, you get, like, a pair of socks for Christmas, so what, what I fell into that never, it honestly, in my gut, it never felt right to me. And I was just kind of doing it because everyone was doing it is the accumulation philosophy. So I'm just looking at this, like I had a 401k, even as a musician, it was crazy as a musician to have a 401k and health benefits, but I did. So I was in the 401k game and I'm thinking of this accumulation thing. And then I start getting into nutrition. I'm like, these people that are 65 years old retiring, they're not healthy enough to do anything fun. So it's like, they're just put it off, put it off, put it off. And most people are working jobs they hate. Thankfully, I wasn't in that scenario. Which is part of the disease and malnutrition anyway, because if yes. you hate your job, that's going to impact your health, man. Dude, a hundred percent. The stress that's just chronic and it's in the background all the time. Yeah, absolutely. So, so how do you, how do you shift people out of this, this accumulation philosophy? Well, I guess let's, let's just explain the core differences here because we're, we're using words like accumulation philosophy, which people might even not know what we're talking about, which is basically just the scrimp and save, put your money away in traditional investments like 401k and hope you have enough money to outlive you when you retire versus your philosophy. What are kind of the core differences there? So I'll break down accumulation is that people believe, people believe these fundamental things in accumulation. It takes money to make money, high risk equals high return, and you're in it for the long haul. Now, if we break that down, it's money times rate times time. So it's set money aside, wait for 30 years, and hope that it grows. It's very linear, but people believe it's exponential. They think it's gonna be this hockey stick through compounding interest, but compounding interest because of fees, because of volatility, because of companies not making it in the long haul, because you know, companies go out of business and people don't account for that in their returns. Mm. We've just seen that 95% of people are not economically independent at age 65. That's mm. the U.S. Department of Labor statistics. So that's a 95% failure rate. I kind of look at that like the food pyramid. It's yes. like, it's so antiquated. It doesn't work, but it's been the thing that everybody has worked, you know, worked from or believed in if they never questioned it. And when do you find out the food pyramid doesn't work is when you're in disease when you're overweight, when you're like, but I had my six to 11 servings of bread and I had my <laughs> minimal, minimal fats. And, you know, I, I did at least it meant some fruits and vegetables a little bit, you know, but it's yeah. a pretty, and, and that's kind of what happens with our money is everyone's selling us these things that they're not buying themselves. A bank doesn't believe that you're in it for the long haul. They look for immediate cash flow. You know, Wall Street doesn't believe it takes money to make money. It believe it's your money they're going to make money on. Right? right. You know? Right. And, and so, if we just dissect this and we're like, well, the alternative is how the economy works, which is velocity. So velocity is a simple equation. GDP, which is our output, divided by M2, which is the money supply. So the number of times the dollars exchange hands in a given year tells us what the velocity is, right? So if I buy something from you, you get to take that money, you get to use it again. Whoever you buy, you know, that money. So if we can have that money circulate, you know, even if that's a finite amount of money, the number of times it circulates expands wealth. Exchange creates that wealth. Accumulation doesn't have us consider exchange. It just has us consider slowly accumulating over time. So how does this work in our personal finances? If we take our output divided by our input, that tells us our velocity. So how do we increase velocity? Three ways. 
Now, the slowest and most dangerous way is what most people try to do. They budget. Right. right? They go, I'll lower my lifestyle. I'll defer my enjoyment. I'll do reductionist thinking. But no one really drinks their way to wealth. But yes, it might mean that they end up with more money, right? But they might not enjoy life. So the two other ways that I like to focus on is efficiency. So what if we could plug leaks? What if we find people overpaid on tax? Are they overpaid yeah. on interest? Are they overpaid on insurance fees? Um, or they have duplicate coverages or investment fees that are non-performing or you know things like that. What if we plug those leaks? We can get more output with the same dollars that they started with, right? So more output. Or the bigger game is expanding our means. Mm -hmm. What if we could scale or impact more people or more deeply impact people with the same dollars? Because we either keep our money in motion or because we've invested in ourselves, and then we can produce more with the money that we make. So velocity is more about cash flow and accumulation is more about compounding. And most people feel that compounding is the way to go because that's what we've been sold. But yes. compounding always works for the institution. It seldomly works for the individual. And I know this is, her this is like heresy for some people, right? <laughs> yeah. This is like, this is like whole grains aren't good. What? Right, right. You know, this <laughs> is like, you know it, it, it's, it's this whole notion that, this is just what everybody's doing, but it's not working, even if that's right. what everybody's doing. And it's not what the institutions are doing. So we want to kind of look at what's really happening here in order to decipher this. And scarcity exacerbates the problem because when we're in scarcity, then we get into shrinking level thinking. We become more selfish and we don't create as much value and it's dollars that follow value. So if you're in scarcity, the things I find is number one, spend time with people who are more abundant. So mm -hmm. they can ask you questions you don't know how to ask of yourself. So they can uplift you and that you can learn from them. Or serve people when you feel like you're in scarcity. Rather than wallowing in your dismay and your worry, why not instead find someone and deliver value to them? Because in that conversation, if you can find a way to serve someone, you're going to feel better if they appreciate you than if you just sit around and be like, I don't know what to do. And look, we're in a time right now where something like a virus just puts <laughs> people in sheer panic. Right, it's just crazy. In panic, and and now their conversations become about that instead of about production. Their life becomes about what they're fearing they might lose versus what they could do to deliver value and create gain. And yeah. So it's it's because people operate most of the time from scarcity rather than abundance, and people in scarcity believe that scarcity is real. They just believe, yeah. like like Thomas Malthus said, um, you know, that we were going to run out of food hundreds of years ago. Uh -huh. We haven't because of innovation. Right? right, because things can grow, and as long as we do certain things right, we have a good ecosystem for it. So, or, I mean, it's just this belief that there's only so much to go around, but abundance says, even if there's a finite amount of specific resources, we could be more resourceful. Human ingenuity, innovation, resourcefulness, efficiencies, you know, like uh, invention. Mm -hmm. and, and so abundance doesn't mean that we frolic through fields holding hands and levitate. It just means that we make choices that are governed by value creation instead of choices governed by scarcity. That's what it comes down to. Yeah, and there has to be a self-awareness there too because I love the idea of you talking about productivity because I know when I came from the traditional world of budgeting prior to Wealth Factory, the onboarding process for Wealth Factory was amazing, not to make it sound like a sales pitch here, but it's like it was really extremely eye-opening for me going through how I was budgeting. It was traditional like mint.com, but there's so many categories and all that. Like even if I just look at health, it's like, functional medicine doctor, nutritional supplements, groceries, all these things. I was like, where do I put these? Then you narrowed it down to these, the, the idea of productive and protective expenses. So now I'm categorizing things into just four categories. But the scarcity mindset, people don't even think about productive and protective. It becomes this thing of, like you said, most wealthy people don't look at purchases just based on price. They look at right. value and cost. So yep. can you talk about that value-based spending? Yeah, so there's three measures of worth. And the first measure is where most people get stuck if they're in scarcity, which is, what's the price? Right. right. And so if they're just looking for a lower price, they might not consider the time it took to find a better price. And what is their time worth? Right. Or so that's cost price. opportunity, right? Yeah, opportunity price. cost, yeah. Opportunity cost. So price is what we pay, but cost is the economic impact, what you're talking about, the opportunity cost. There's something that could be low price and high cost. Yes. I just think of McDonald's as a good example. You can get <laughs> example. low price value menu, high cost with whatever the hell they are putting it in those fries <laughs> and the pink sludge and whatever all that stuff is. 
It's right. crazy how many McDonald's CEOs have had heart attacks too, by the way. I mean, you know, like, like yeah, that's low price, but it's high cost because you're going to pay for it in your health. Sure. And that's going to be in the hospital or lost energy or whatever it might be. So cost is the economic impact. I might have an account that costs twice as much, but they saved me four times more. It's actually a lower overall cost, even though the price is higher. And right. if we only measure on price and don't consider cost, we can easily get duped because anyone can make something cheap. But what, is it going to be sustainable? Is it going to be valuable? Is it going to last? And I think this is what we can see in retail. There's a lot of people that go jump after something that's on sale for 50% that they didn't want in the first place because they're governed by price. Right. Cost is the economics. And then the third piece is value. Value is your own personal preference, feeling of satisfaction, feeling of joy, feeling of happiness, feeling of fulfillment. It's just what you want. And most people feel guilty for even wanting those things because of well-intentioned preachers, teachers, family, and friends telling them what they should like or not like, like they have any say in it. Value is perspective. So if you begin with value first, cost second, price third, that's financial freedom. That's that money is no longer the primary reason or excuse why you would do or not do something. It's only a consideration. Right. Most people, it's the only consideration, right? right. So, so I feel like the, understanding the three measures of worth, I'm like, what's the price? What's the cost? What's the value? I'm willing to pay a lot more for certain things because the value is exponentially greater. Steve Jobs really understood this one thing more than anything else. He understood that if he hired amazing people, he could get a 99 to one return on them. Now mm -hmm. he might pay them 25, you know, 250% more than other firms were paying employees of the same, you know, title, but he was getting a 99 to one return on who they were because he hired the best. But most yeah. people hire cheap and they get less, right? right? right. So that's just one example. Well, I love it too about it. It's, it's subjective because it's, you're looking at it, you used a great example in Budgeting Sucks where you said, hey, if, if a Rolex is worth more than $7,500 of value, if that's more valuable to you as an individual, anyone who tells you that you wasted money is simply wrong. And that's it. It's different for every individual. Like a great example of this is like, I'll do coaching calls with people, people that are trying to free up time for fitness or whatever. And I'm like, they find out that they think I'm wasteful because they find out that I pay for grocery delivery and I refuse to, to clean my own house or that I have an Airbnb and I have someone manage it for me and they take 15% off the top. But I run, I run multiple companies from my home. It, the, the hour and a half it takes me to go out to the grocery store, I can be more productive in that time than the three ninety nine dollars grocery delivery fee, right? Totally. I mean, it's, it's opportunity cost, right? It's yes. It's valuing your time. It's basically saying, hey, what do you enjoy and what don't you enjoy? And what's going to, like, here's the thing. This is critical. And I, this isn't in any of my books yet. This will be in my next book. Okay. But part of what, prevents people from being wealthy is escapism and escapism is when we either first sacrifice for someone else right like they sacrifice themselves because when we sacrifice for others it's an excuse for us not to be responsible for ourselves so why aren't we further ahead well i was raising kids and because i was sacrificing for my kids i couldn't do x y and z right sure um, i sacrificed my health because I was starting a business, right? So it's, it's this excuse that people have where they're giving up something that's important because they're saying something else was urgent. And right. this is the crux of society. The next thing is, another part of escapism is when we're confronted with something that we have to take real responsibility for and we have to really value ourselves, it's easy to create false busyness. Mm -hmm. Like I'm busy because I've got to clean the house and mow the lawn and organize the garage. And I'm busy because this new TV series that I've been waiting for just came out. And I'm busy because, I mean, I could just go through the list, right? For me, well, I, I recognize one of my escapisms was I was listening to sports talk radio in the morning. I didn't even watch sports very often. So yeah. like, why am I listening? To, I'm just doing it because I was being lazy and I didn't want to deal with certain things. And so it's a way to tune out. So what sure. did I do differently? I just confronted the things that were confronting me and I dealt with it rather yeah. than delaying it. We delay so many things that become excuses and that prevent us from wealth and they actually invite scarcity. So here's, here's another example. Anytime we're not truly ourselves, let's say you ask me a question. I'm like, well, I don't want to disappoint this one. I'm just going to, I'm just going to tell him part of the story. Right? Mm -hmm. So if I do that, I actually just created another actor in my life that never has to live that lie. 
Right. And the more actors I create, the more I'm a chameleon, the more exhausted I am trying to hold up these false pretenses because part of it is we just don't know what people are going to think about us. It, but what they have to understand, everybody understands we're all human beings and nobody loves someone that's perfect. We right. love people when they're willing to express their imperfections and be okay with it because it gives confidence and hope to us. And so, so escapism is such a big reason why people don't get wealthy or why they don't do what you do, why they would complain about a three ninety nine delivery fee or they would complain because if they're busy doing that, they have an excuse for why they didn't live up to their potential. But if they yeah. go for their potential and don't live up to it, they might only have themselves to blame. But here's the deal. We're all going to live up to our potential. It's just how long it's going to take in right. this life or the next. Right. So I'm like, might as well do it now. And if you just confront these situations, you might find yourself worthy of paying this. I mean, it might be because we heard a parent say, why would you waste your money doing that? Well, it might be a yep. waste for them and not a waste for us. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I hear it so many times because I have a lot of moms in my audience and then I'll, I'll bring that up to them. Hey, if you're short on time, like hire a house cleaner or a grocery delivery. And the very first thing they say to me more often than not is they say, oh my God, my mother would kill me. Like, cause their mother will look at them as a failure because they don't clean their own house. And this goes back to this epigenetic stuff, man. Like yep. we got to push this stuff out. Look, man, my wife, uh, when we had our, our second kid, so now we have two kids, she's starting to like not sleep enough. She's starting to get really tired. She would take him to the store and it's like 10 times more work. Like I took him once just myself to see what she's going through. One's hiding in the clothes rack. I can't <laughs> find where the hell they are. The other one's crying in the, in, the, in the stroller. I'm like, oh my God. So I tried to tell her, why don't you hire some help? She's like, I couldn't do that. I, like, I'm a mom. Yeah. I'm like, I get maybe my mom, uh, maybe you should talk to my mom. My mom worked and I feel like I turned out pretty well. And uh, your mom worked and you turned out pretty well. I'm like, so I don't know where you're getting this. So what I decided to do is go to my wealthiest friends that the women weren't necessarily working, but they still had a nanny. Sure. Right. Yeah. Even if it was part time because I had her hear it from them. And yeah. by hearing it from them, we hired this girl, Amber, which I could only hope to be half the parent that she was, the nanny, dude. She was so <laughs> focused on our kids and adored our kids. The day she left to go back to Minneapolis, she was in her car bawling and my wife's in the house bawling because yeah. we were so connected and she was so great. And you know what it gave? It gave my wife freedom to go do some things for herself because this was the lesson for her. I said, hey, quantity doesn't equal quality. And if you're exhausted and bitter, you don't want to be around the kids. You yeah. want to actually go take a break, review, you know, renew and rejuvenate because the bottom line is kids are a lot of work. Under four, they're romance and sleep terrorists. I don't see it as a <laughs> option. We have the cash. Let's do it. But yeah. some people would never invest in themselves that way because someone else would see them. But guess what? Epigenetic work and recontextualize. Have people understand where you're coming from and just work on your side of the equation. The more we try to let other people dictate what we do in life, we have to recognize one thing. When someone's in scarcity, they're thinking irrationally. And if we, get, if we succumb to that scarcity, we're now a part of it. So yeah. like if someone's like, oh, my mom will kill me. I'm like, dude, your mom's in scarcity about that. Get over it. Exactly. Get over it. Who, exactly. Like, they're going to love you anyway. You yeah. don't have to earn. Like my message to my kids is you don't have to earn my love. You don't have to earn my love. You have it. Right. I could be disappointed. I could be mad. I could be sad about your choices, but I will unconditionally love you and I believe in you. Like yeah. that's the whole message, you know? That's your only job, man. It's like, the, you're, you're so right. The wealthiest dude I know, one of my best friends in the world, lives in a different country and I go and stay with him a couple times a year and we have a great time. So he's got this big giant house. He has a live-in au pair. He has like a CEO that manages his entire uh Household. Like, yeah, the whole household and everything. And then he has a live-in au pair that takes care of these two kids. And even me at first, because of my program, I was like, well, that's interesting. The kids are kind of with this au pair all day. And then it's like family dinner time. And we're all eating dinner together. The au pair, the kids love this au pair. They still love their parents to death. She's not replacing the parents. It's like this beautiful, like communal thing that I had never been exposed to. I was like, this is gorgeous. Like, I love this. You know what I mean? Yeah. I remember when I got a Bentley, my brother-in-law said, don't you feel guilty I said, about what? He goes, don't you? And like, this is, he's a pretty enlightened cat. Like he just was being really open with me. He's like, don't you feel like you give that money to charity instead? I said, hey, I said, let me be really clear about this. It's not an either or. It's not mm -hmm. an either or. Right. Like, I, I bought this 
and you know, I enjoy driving. I let my employees drive it for date night. Like it's a daily <laughs> nice. driver for me. Like yeah. it's kind of fun. I'm like, and I still have 1% of all my revenue that goes towards two social missions that are really important to me to pay it forward. And yeah. I give my time of those two. So it didn't preclude that. Right. It, didn't, it, it wasn't a, if I do this, I can't do that. That's scarcity. Scarcity has this belief there's dilemmas, that there's lose-lose or win-lose scenarios. And look, man, the world believes in this big time. Mm -hmm. Part of it's because I think we're addicted to sports as a, as a country and as a, a world. And in sports, it's winner versus loser. It's yep. us versus them. But dude, you're into music. Music is not a winner-loser game. Everyone can benefit from music. It's abundant. Absolutely. I can listen to the song. You can, we could both love the song. I can learn to play the song. Like, music is so abundant, right? Yeah. And, and people believe that life is a competition. Take what's mine. Get what's mine. Take and get are selfish. They're scarcity. And the real winners in the, in the world are the ones that are giving. They're, mm -hmm. they're creating value. And there's so much to be had with that because velocity means we just keep circulating those dollars because we've exchanged goods, services, and we get wealthier. And when people can understand that life is not a zero sum game, the business, yes, there are some businesses that are all about competition, but the businesses that are about collaboration can go a lot further and help a lot more people. Yeah, absolutely. It's not a zero sum game. And it's like, I love the idea of you, you saying you can do both. Like my dad told me my dad's a self-made guy. My whole community knows this cause he's active in my company, but, um, he just built his dream house on a lake and it's extravagant. The thing is insane. And he also, when he sold this company in 2016, 10% of that was automatically put into a charitable trust and he just funds 501 C threes wherever he sees fit. Dude has given a ridiculous amount of money to charities and he bought his dream lake house. You can do both. And yeah. the thing is, it's just like the, the value. It's different for both people. So I want to help people. There's two phrases you use, and I want to make sure I have them both correct as well. Can you talk about the idea of financial independence versus financial freedom? Mm -hmm.